Hello. Is it good morning? It's still good morning. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, just a, an apology from my um, colleague, uh, Dr. Natasha Lord, um, who is the inpatient psychologist and lead on older adult mental health at uh, Worcestershire Health and Care NHS Trust. Unfortunately, she couldn't be here today, so she's very apologetic about that. So I'll be presenting on behalf of both of us. Um, my name is Sheena Painlon. I'm the um, Historic Environment Record Officer at Worcester City Council. Um, and I thought I'd start off, so Worcester Life Stories is um, all about sort of reminiscence, memory and people's stories. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about our story first. Uh, so this is uh, myself and Tash. Uh, trying to look vaguely professional, uh, standing outside the Guildhall in Worcester, uh, pointing a poster for our uh, public event that we ran last summer. Um, we go back a long way. We met at Sixthorn College. Here's us on a boozy night out. Um, glittery car uh, cardigans and everything. Oh, but we'll go back to the professional stuff, because uh, that's better, isn't it? Uh, she won't thank me for that. Um, so... Um, I managed the historic environment record, um, and a few years ago, um, we acquired a huge collection of historic photographs, um, around about 40,000 of them. So our um, planning colleagues and our conserv conservation colleagues had collected these um, from 1951 onwards. A very large proportion of them are uh, from a survey in 1951, so they've got great potential for use for the public. And they were sat in the office in a great big um, um, sort of filing cabinet. They were being used by the conservation officers on a daily basis because they were a great resource, um, stored by, street by street, so they're searchable. Um, but we had an issue because we were moving office. So very thankfully, our uh, development management um, uh, service manager uh, gave us the money to digitise them. So we've now got this wealth of four terabytes of these historic photos sitting on our server. Um, and obviously I'm very aware of the potential of these for public engagement. Uh, we are using them for building conservation and day-to-day um, -day use, but um, you know, there's obviously a much greater use for them. Um, so I'm sitting at my desk one day, and Tash phones me up, and I think, oh, great, we're going out for some wine. But no, no, she wanted me for work-related things. Uh, and she, working with older adults, was very interested in... Uh, whether we had any resources that we could use for reminiscence work. Um, one of the things that's very, um, sort of very recognised technique within um, um, older adult mental health, dementia, um, and those sorts of things, is life story work, which is all about bringing together um, sort of memory triggers for people that are potentially living with um, poor memory, dementia, um, or low mood in their, in their older adult years. Um, so we started getting excited and we started cooking up this, um, this project uh, to involve in the, this uh, resource. Um, so our idea was that what we wanted to do initially is just get this collection online for the very first time, uh, make it accessible to the general public, um, possibly um, using a sort of um, a model like um, Bristol's life... Um, Bristol's Know Your Place, uh, so it would be geographically and thematically searchable, but then also it's got the potential for other data sets to be added at a later date. We can add our HER data in and so on, so it will have that flexibility. Uh, but for the current purposes, the photographic material. Um, linked to that, what we wanted to uh, achieve was for the community to be able to engage with that material by adding their own, so they can start to create their own narratives and their own uh, life story material uh, using oral histories and their own photographs and materials that they might have at home. So making that really easy for people to upload that kind of content. Uh, and then work with uh, a variety of partners, service users, um, to develop uh, the online Worcester Life Stories Toolkit for reminiscence therapy. Um, so that would be an add-on to that, pro that, um, web that platform, that website, so you can suck out the material that is relevant to you and download your own... Um, life story in an automated way. Um, life story uh, software is currently quite an expense for the NHS. It's a really expensive product that, um, uh, to get hold of. Um, and actually having that ready-made um, sort of copyright-free material that you can access that can be used for reminiscence is something that's quite hard to get hold of. Um, 
So moving on from that, we wanted to develop a series of model workshops for use with the various partners in the project and other professionals and groups so that they can um, sort of use best practice to get this material out um, for people uh, partly living with dementia, but I'll come on to the other people that we want to uh, focus on. Uh, so we want to engage with, as I said, people living with dementia, not just older adults, but uh, people living with young onset dementia, which is... Um, uh, quite a problem uh, for people. Uh, they're carers, because uh, obviously there's a huge impact on um, the well-being and mental health of the carers of people uh, living with dementia. Um, people in the community that are at risk of loneliness. Now I've found out all sorts of quite alarming statistics about people that are isolated in their own homes as part of this project. Um, the studies suggest that people living with loneliness, the impact of loneliness has the same impact as smoking 15 cigarettes a day which is really quite frightening. So, you know, sort of getting to people that are isolated in their own homes is actually quite a, a really worthwhile thing to be doing. And then, of course, the, the wider community, not just through events, but also um, by engaging them with um, the process of getting that material online, um, volunteering, uh, digitising, adding um, commentary and comments to the material. Um, We've been developing a number of partnerships as we've been going along. So a uh, key one for us that we're really keen to pursue is the Institute of Dementia Studies at the University of Worcester as research partners. And they've been really um, enthusiastic about this project. They um, uh, helped us set up our initial uh, public consultation event, which I'll come on to in a bit. Uh, and yeah, they're, they're going to be a great partner for us. So we really want to make sure that we keep them involved. Uh, Age UK Reconnections Project, that's our inroad really um, to people um, living at home, um, isolated at home. Uh, it's a project to connect people with, with services and with projects that will integrate them back in, into groups in society or find ways of kept connecting them to other people. So, you know, they stand a chance of actually reforming friendships and that kind of thing. Uh, Worcestershire Association of Carers have been very engaged with the project. Um, the, you know, a huge number of people that are providing care in an official or an unofficial capacity for friends and relatives. Um, Porter's Living, social housing provider, um, they've been really positive. Uh, they've got an engagement officer who has um, spent a lot of time working with us. Uh, um, they, they obviously provide um, social housing for older adults, um, sheltered accommodation and that kind of thing. Um, and they, they're also very um, sort of um, mobilised with um, digital enablement, which is another strand that we want to be um, looking at as part of the project. Uh, Connection Point, we've been working with them, an early onset dementia group, um, which we talked about earlier. Alzheimer's Society, they um, run their um, monthly outscaf. Uh, so they get um, older adults together um, from the community and share memories and, and have a cup of tea and a nice slice of cake. And it's a really nice place for people to come together and get support from services. And then finally, the Museum of Local Life, who already have a photograph uh, project. They've been working on a um, collection called The Changing Face of Wor Worcester for some years, and they've been uploading that material as well. Um, so, moving on to our public consultation, we, after we gathered all that momentum with uh, the partners, uh, we wanted to uh, speak to the public and see whether they thought this was a good idea and whether they wanted to be um, involved. Uh, so we set up um, an event at the Guildhall in Worcester. Um, it was uh, an all-day event for all ages, we budgeted for all ages, and uh, we really heavily promoted it through <coughs> Facebook. So. Um, Worcester City Council have got their own Facebook page, has 21,000 followers, so that's an immediate sort of way to, to get out to people. Um, we've also got a really active um, Facebook page called Worcestershire Memories, um, which I can't remember how many thousand people followed that, but huge amounts of discussion about um, people's memories of Worcester and growing up and all oh, it's so much better in the old days and sharing photos and that kind of thing. Um, and we've got a, an amazing response from that. So, sort of drip feeding a few photos in the lead up to the event really got people engaging, got them sharing their memories, and uh, we were able to capture some of those memories to actually share on the day so we could sort of feed that back. 
Um, so what we did was we set up uh, the High Street in 1951. So we invited people uh, to time travel, effectively, walk down the High Street. So we had the two rows of the two sides of the street set up in photos all of the way along the lower hall of the Guildhall in Worcester. So we've got enough photos to be able to do that. It's such an amazing collection. And it really, it really grabbed people. Um, we were a little bit uh, shocked when we opened the door at 11 o'clock in the morning and about 200 people sort of streamed in. They were queuing out the door down the high street. Amazing. Um, but you can see we've got sort of tables set up. We had um, cakes on, on tiered stands. We made it very 1950s. We've got nice tablecloths and um, people sitting around and reminiscing and writing down some of their memories. We had activities for children, um, colouring in. We've got them making peg dolls. Um, fantastic. And, um, and what we were finding was that people sort of formed a very orderly queue along the street looking at these photos. And they were sort of turning to each other in the queue. And they might not have known each other, but they were having these conversations between each other and sort of reminiscing together. So it was really sort of bringing people together. Um, yeah, over the course of the day, we had, we, didn't, we lost count at 1,000 people. So it completely overwhelmed us, to be honest. But some of the nice things, um, there's some members of the public that have brought in things to show us. So this gentleman on the right brought in some photos of the old power station in Worcester that's now been demolished. And the ladies on the left there have been to see the Beatles at uh, the old bingo hall in, in Worcester. So you know, a few nice things to come immediately. Uh, and then we also captured people's memories on, on these, uh, some memories and some thoughts about the project on these consultation boards. So... That's all the fun stuff. Uh -huh. um, I thought I'd really sort of talk about some of the challenges that we faced in sort of pu pulling this project together. So do excuse me if I refer to my notes because I kind of want to get it right, really. Um, obviously, we all have the issue of uh, uh, the challenges of time delivering this kind of project and delivering community archaeology and heritage um, to our, our um, wider audiences. So it really is an issue for us all. Um, but the biggest challenge of developing a project of this is that front-loading of time before you can even get to the stage of applying for funding. Developing a project with multiple partners takes a considerable amount of time and effort and energy, and unless you have adequate time to devote within your existing work schedule, then it becomes impossible. Many of us juggle multiple roles alongside, uh, already alongside multiple ongoing projects, so where do we find the time for project development? Another issue is funding, uh, particularly multifaceted projects like ours. So one of the challenges that we face with this one when seeking the funding is the fact that it straddles heritage and health, as well as digital enablement, and a strong desire to evidence the benefits of this approach through sound research and partnership with the university, which comes at a cost. It has been remarkably difficult to encompass all of these elements via a single funding stream, and therefore, enabling this project to happen has become very complex. Um, making the project tangible and keeping a focus on it is also quite a challenge. Uh, many partners have many differing agendas, even if these differences are only slight. Everyone you talk to wants to get something slightly different from the project, and this can stretch the focus of the project if you're not careful. You've got to hold on to your original purpose. Our partners all do fantastic work, and the key for us has been to link in with that, rather than allow it to steer us in a different direction, unless that direction proves to be the right one, of course. It's a case of being open to open other, uh, open to other ideas and opportunities, whilst being clear about what you ultimately hope to achieve. Um, keeping the momentum going can be a challenge too. If your project development is having to take place alongside the day job, then it can take a long time to get moving, and keeping the momentum can be really tough. It's a challenge to hold on to the interest of your partners, and if you've had any public consultation, the public too. That final push to get funding in place takes some considerable effort, and holding on to your enthusiasm is critical. Of course, there are rewards. Uh, we've been privileged to work with some fantastic partners uh, as part of the development of this project. All of them doing incredible work in the community. They're all extremely passionate and have shown great enthusiasm, enthusiasm for what we're proposing. You can't help but be inspired when you're working alongside, alongside these people that really care as much as they do. <coughs> um, 
Uh, some of these links have led to us being able to support other projects. Uh, for instance, Fortis Living have been doing some of their own reminiscence work with, uh, with the tenants, and we've been able to provide source material and local knowledge. We've also given talks and workshops already to the Alps-CAF and the Con Connection Point Young Onset Dementia Group um, as part of the development of the project. This in itself has been extremely rewarding, seeing people light up with recognition at their local corner shop in the 1950s or the local Bobby on the Beat. Response by social media has been overwhelming. Commentary on photographs that we posted on the Worcestershire Memories Facebook page in the lead-up to the public event are still being commented on now, ten, ten months down the line, and people are realising that they know each other from years ago and sharing stories, so it just keeps sort of, you know, keeps building. Um, a photo quiz that we posted received more than 2,000 responses over a 48-hour period. It's amazing to see the public so engaged with their heritage. Our public event was just fantastic. As I said, more than 1,000 people through the doors and such an amazing buzz, everyone sort of chatting to each other. Everyone from a tiny baby to a 99-year-old 90, lady with a 70-year-old daughter were there. So, a bit of reflection. Um, the experience of this particular project and the stumbling blocks that we faced, coupled with a focus on mental health and well-being, has led us to some interesting reflection on the whole process of developing community projects and the impact that this can have us, on us as professionals. I'm going to tackle this from my perspective as a public sector archaeologist um, with a lot of questions and perhaps playing devil's advocate a little. First of all, there are huge rewards for partnership with local groups and the community, especially when we are seeing those groups and individuals engage with their heritage and value it. As community archaeologists, most of us, I think, do this because we're passionate about it in delivering archaeology and heritage to and with the public because it's the right thing to do. We should be doing it. But we also need to be careful not to become casualties of our own enthusiasm. This especially in a political climate where culture and heritage certainly appear to be undervalued. A-level archaeology, anyone? Sometimes it feels that we break ourselves to see things through, all the while are hitting our heads against a three-foot-thick foot wall of so what? How do we maintain our enthusiasm in the face of that? How often does cynicism and disillusionment replace our desire to explore and share heritage? As community archaeologists, we need to be tough. Despite a growing understanding of the links between heritage and well-being, we still need to be better at evidencing these links and fully demonstrating the impact of projects, as well as being open and honest about the things that don't work and why. It was certainly heartening to hear Ian Morrison referring to the public value framework on um, day one of the conference, uh, which is being produced by Historic England. Um, so it'd be interesting to see where that goes. We have all these fantastic ideas and the skills to deliver them, but we're not necessarily enabled to just get on and do it. We have to become project developers, funding experts, negotiators, people and project managers, sometimes social workers. The list goes on. We're archaeologists, aren't we? Where do we acquire the skills to ma manage this many tentacled beast? Where do we... Uh, sorry, wrong bit. The rewards of partnership... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Um, the rewards of partnership working can be a benefit here. For instance, working with medical professionals to engage with people living with dementia. But there are considerable challenges to our own mental health and well-being that aren't being addressed. How do we protect ourselves from being disillusioned with the process when we keep hitting that three-foot thick wall? It would be nice to do this, but we can't find funding. There isn't time to put in an application. HLF won't fund that, etc. How do we protect ourselves when facing often challenging behaviour or the complex needs of the public while remaining dispassionate? And how do we avoid burnout when we try and fail to be all things to everyone? Can community archaeology, or indeed archaeology, really exist for its own sake in the current climate, or is it stacked against the need to make money? Has it just become a tick box exercise for some archaeologists? I would argue that community archaeology is all about how we make people feel, how they respond to being part of something, their well-being and health benefits through connecting to not only archaeology and heritage as a subject matter, but for the action of bringing people together, giving a sense of purpose and being part of something. If this is the reason for what we're doing, then why are we not focusing more attention on collecting proper me metrics and data and proving the value of community archaeology, making the links between monetary value 
Um, sorry, making the links between the subject matter as a delivery vehicle and help, and subsequently on the monetary value of improving well-being through community engagement. Make the case for better funding and recognition of the heritage sector. Embed core funding in community archaeology and be a have-to-have service and not just nice to have. So, yeah, okay. So, now that I've depressed you all, <laughs> I thought I'd leave you with a nice picture of a horse to really make you smile as you leave. Um, but I'd finally like to say that after all those musings, uh, myself and my colleague Tash have experienced some real highs and lows over the last couple of years. And I personally have had a period of time uh, signed off with stress and low mood. Uh, so you can draw your own conclusions from that. Um, but as of today, our funding bid is currently pending. Thank you. Thank you.